Hey, we're Augmenters. And today we are here to talk about creating community and belonging through mentoring. I'm Julie. And I'm Jimmy. On today's show, we welcome Mark Joseph, who you will come to know as Gramps, who is the founder of babyboomer.org. Mark has lived past lives as an entrepreneur in various industries, always focused on sales and marketing. His book is called, I Don't Want to Turn Three, which makes me think back to some past Halloween costumes I have worn. Yet, on today's show, you will hear about cross-generational mentoring, the power of listening to form bonds, volunteering, and of course, drumroll please, pickleball. We are excited for you to hear what we learned. Here we go. Mark, Joseph, we are so excited to have you on Augmenters today. How are you doing? Ah, I appreciate the invitation. Thank you so much. I'm doing great. Well, honestly, I have been really looking forward to this conversation for a long time. And I will say, okay, I'm about to turn 50. I like, I no, it's a thing. You've never told me that before, Julie. Give me some new information. It's truly unbelievable. But I am seen as you know, time goes on, the things you prioritize, the things you care about when you're, you know, a young whippersnapper like Jimmy, you know, building businesses and, you know, all the things and like, it's all wonderful and exciting. But I can see as you get a bit older, you keep thinking about what kind of an impact you're making on others and how you can continue to give back, not in just in the sense of making others feel good, but the sense of making you feel good. So knowing that you have an incredible media empire, babyboomer.org, which we cannot wait to hear more about, how do you see mentoring evolve as you evolve into different stages in your life? Well, first of all, don't uh, realize that even though you're turning 50, that's the new 40. So when you're 60, that's a new 50. When you're 70, it's a new 60. So you're really much younger than you feel. Uh, or, I mean, or, I feel I feel like thirty. So yes, that is probably true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you've got that. But you know what happens as you grow older, you grow wiser. And the only reason you grow wiser is because every decade you make so many more mistakes that you learn from them. So you know you're smarter when you're sixty than you're fifty, and you're smarter when you're seventy when you're sixty, just because you made so many many more mistakes. So the the idea is. You know, what do you do with that knowledge? You know, you can take it to your grave, but that's not what it's all about. You know, I think one of the things that the baby boomer generation has learned that, you know, it's important to give back with everything that we have uh, gone through from, you know, growing up right after World War II to the Vietnam War to the, the, our state of our union today. It's important for our generation to give back. And, you know, we all need to be mentors. Uh, just because we've learned so more, so much more, we've made so many more mistakes that, you know, let's, let's teach others from learning from our mistakes so they don't make the same ones. Amen to that. Amen. So, Amen. So what is a memorable mistake of yours that you enjoy sharing in an early mentoring conversation you might have with somebody? Well, probably the main mistake that, that, that I see uh, that, you know, when you're growing up in your 20s and your Thursday 30s, you know, your idea is it's time to go out and make a living. It's time to make an impact. It's time to make some money. All okay? right. So you've got to have a balancing act between making money and driving your own career and being who you are with with your family. And I think one of the greatest things when I look back and I, I think that's one of the reasons that I wrote my children's book. I don't know if you guys are aware of it. It's called, uh, Ooh, let's see. I, I don't want to turn three. It's a true story of uh, my uh, six grandkids and so forth, but we can get that later. But you know, what I learned early on, what I learned now that I should have done early on is you've got to create a life balance with your work. I mean, I, you know, I, I was so busy trying to climb the ladder and, you know, make an impact on, on business and so forth. But, you know, I ignored my family too much. You know, I, I wasn't there for all the soccer games and the basketball games or these concerts. You know, and I think as I look back, if there's one thing that, that I would want to get to the youngest generation is make that life balance. Make sure that as you're growing and becoming your own person and then doing what you that you also don't leave that out for not being there for your kids. 
And I, I can see that, that, that I wasn't there enough for my kids and I'm overcompensating trying to be there a lot for my grandkids. <laughs> and they're like, oh, actually, we're good. No, it's okay. <laughs> Yeah, well, and also how great for your kids to get to have the additional set of hands and get to have you around now, because I think you probably have a really different relationship with them than you would have when they were little. So that's, that's really cool. And do you find like in work settings or in settings that you're having these conversations, say with younger people who are in that phase in their life, do you feel they're receptive to hearing that? Or do you think they're kind of like, no, no, you don't understand, I still have to... Keep grinding. I think they are receptive. I think, and, and again, uh, the, the generations today are smarter than our generations. I, I am thoroughly convinced now that these young kids from one to 10 years old are going to be the greatest generation this country has ever produced. You know, the reason being is as soon as they come out of the womb, they're on the internet. They got their cell phones. I didn't get on the internet till I was 40 years old. These kids are coming out one, two, three. If I want anything done on my phone or my computer, I call my grandkids. You know, they know how to do it. Um, so they have so much more information. They have the ability to learn so much more that they're going to be the greatest generation ever. And it's up to us to make sure they are. It's up to us to make sure they don't mess it up. Well, I have to share the story. I was in a board meeting earlier this week. And the executive director goes, for a little levity, everybody, my 10-year-old daughter is downstairs asking Alexa what it was like before the internet for a homework assignment. <laughs> and like everybody on the meeting just like looked around and was like, oh, this is like a crazy, you know, Black Mirror episode of like having to ask the AI, you know, what was it before the internet? So a question, I don't want to ask AI, I want to ask you, you already said, okay, the next generation will be the greatest, but we already have a greatest generation. And I know you have a background in sales and marketing. I love slogans and branding. So I wanted to ask you, why did the names for generations really fall off? You know, we had the greatest generation, excellent, excellent name. Okay. And important. Then we had baby boomers. Okay. Another great name, but then like Gen Y, Gen Z, like millennials. Millennials got a little juice to it. But like, what's this next generation? Like, how should they be branding themselves now to understand that, that almost like, like need or what they need to manifest if they want to live in, if they want to create a world they want to live in? Well, what do you got for a name? Oh, the greatest youngest generation ever. The youngest generation. <laughs> the youngest. I kind of like youngest. <laughs> you know, because... You know, when you, when you think about it, the role of parents and grandparents in today's world is to offset all this stuff they're learning on the Internet. You know, if we're not careful, these kids could be on their screens four or five hours a day. You know, it's up to us as parents and grandparents to get them out of that, to, to get them out and play, get them outside, get them off their screens. You know, and, and one of the greatest things that we can do as parents and grandparents is actually sit down and read books to these kids, you know, get them off the screens and doing kids. You know, when you think about it, reading a book to a kid, uh, there's all kinds of benefits that help make this generation greater than it ever was. You know, the first thing that you know, I'm picturing, you know, take a book like mine, it takes 20 minutes to read. It's not a big deal, but it's got a message. It's got a story. So the first thing that happens when you actually read books to kids is it creates a bonding experience. Okay. Again, they're off their phone. They're off the, the internet. It gives you a chance to spend some nice time together. It may only be 20 minutes, but there they are sitting on your lap and you're reading together and you're bonding for them. That has to help with mentorship. That helps to help with, you know, how they view the world as they grow up. You know, another reason we have to spend time reading books to our kids is that it supports listening skills. Now, you mentioned sales. One of the greatest things that, that, that I think all of us have learned that the best skill that we have is how do you develop listening skills? You need it as, as podcasters because you got to you know, ask the next question to your guests. You got to listen to them. You know, and we need it in sales as uh, what's the next greatest thing? What are they going to buy? So if we can teach these kids for that 20 minutes to the listening skills, because reading a book requires it's a one on one kind of thing. You got you got to listen with them. You know, another reason we got to be reading books to these little kids is the cognitive and uh, language development. There's all kinds of words in these books that they don't understand. It gives you as an adult a chance to sit there and explain these words. 
What does it mean? I mean, there's plenty of words in these books I don't understand. I got to go look up. So, you know, it's, it's a great educational thing for us to spend time with these kids and teaching them on the cognitive and language development. And, and then another reason is, you know, anybody who's had kids two, three, four, five years old, they have a small attention span. So if you get them on your lap for 20 minutes, it gives them a chance to concentrate and learn self-development, just discipline and development, you know, that's it. So that's really what we as mentors and adults, whether you're parents or especially grandparents, need to make sure we do to these kids so it balances everything else that they're doing in the real world today. I love it. I uh, I, I often read uh, daily to my two-year-old and uh, the attention span really struck home because you know, we get through three books. That's kind of where we're at. And I like to say at that time, she suddenly in her head is just like squirrel and like takes off. Like she's got to do something else. Well, yesterday we saw a very large squirrel. There was a mascot at an event dressed up like a squirrel to represent our local park. And let me tell you, Fiona, my daughter, was thrilled about this squirrel. She could not believe how big it was she wanted to follow the squirrel around. So, And she did not want to listen to anybody. She only wanted to deal with the squirrel. So I agree with you about the power of, of reading. But I want to bring this to specifically like, like a, a mentoring relationship, especially for adults helping adults. So you mentioned like the power of reading and building these listening skills, especially building a bond. What is an analogous form of reading a book to somebody where two people who are beginning a relationship where one is probably seeking advice or asking questions of another? What are some ways you've seen that baby boomers can really create that bond quickly with somebody that's younger? And maybe that's not just telling them something. Maybe that is showing off their listening skills. So I'd be curious, what do you think those best practices are? Well, let's go back to reading a book again then. Because, again, it goes back to when we were just little kids and growing up. You know, and, and think about it with, with, with your daughter, your two-year-old daughter. Before you even read the book to her, you, you need to say to her, what do you think is going to happen in this book? You know? mm -hmm. And that's also a relationship that you can have as you're with mentoring is, what do you think is going to happen? You know, so that's the first thing to, to create that curiosity. One of the greatest things of mentorship and teaching and, and, and uh, the special reading to the little kids is creating that curiosity. So ask them, what do you think is going to happen? So let them get involved very quickly. You know, as you're reading the book, who are the characters in this book? You know, what is the setting? Again, questioning, letting them start to think. And as a mentor, that's what we need to do in real life. Does anything in this book sound familiar to you, like the squirrel? You know, have you ever heard of a squirrel? You know, does it sound familiar? You know, what was your favorite part of this book? So you can take those lessons that you had when, as a parent reading to a child in a book and, and, and do it to people you're dealing with. You know, just put it into a real life situation. Start asking questions. You know, that's how you learn the most about someone or something. Ask questions that that can help you lead. And then the two of you can decide, you know, is this you the right mentor for me? Or are you the right person to mentor? Asking questions starts the whole conversation. That is so, so true. And I think one of the benefits of being older in the baby boomer generation, especially when you're not also juggling little kids, multiple businesses, sick parents, et cetera, is that you have the time to listen. I think that's one of the biggest barriers is actually creating the space to have a conversation where you can really listen. But I'm curious to talk a little bit about some of the other barriers that potentially um, baby boomers have with mentoring. We do hear people say, I want to do it and I know it would be good for me. And a little bit going back to kind of what you're saying with the kids, like they're kind of home with the TV and they're a little bit in a rut. How do you get some of the baby boomers in your audience to get motivated to mentor? Well, first of all, let's step back and look at baby boomers of today and how they react to the world. 30%, that means one out of every three of us. And this is one of the reasons we started our site at babyboomer.org is to get baby boomers more involved. But one out of three of us really don't care much about their grandkids. That means that if I'm sitting here, there's the guy on my right or my left, they don't care. Their attitude is, hey, I raise great kids, which are you guys, you know, and, you know, let them go, go teach their kids. I got to go play pickleball, you know, so, so, you know. Shout the, out pickleball. The, yeah. So, I mean, they may show up for a birthday or they may come to Christmas, but, but they're really not involved, they, you know, and, and what causes that? What causes grandparents not wanting to be involved or not being involved 
with their grandkids. And, you know, extrapolate this out to, to relationships and mentorship. But if you think about it, one of the reasons that the, the, the grandparents don't get involved with their grandkids is they don't like the spouse that their child married. So there's the disconnect mm. you know, that they want to get involved. You know, the grandparents, and again, when I, I told you earlier, as we get older, we get wiser, we all of a sudden are the, the giving unsolicited advice to our our kids and our grandkids you know they don't they don't want that you know we may uh, disrespect the boundaries of going to visit our kids and you know unannounced you know, our kids don't want to do that so you know there's all kinds of things that that cause the rift between us and our kids and our grandkids and those are the things we we got to we got to get over and those are also the things that in a business situation you got to get over if you're trying to grow an organization. I know you guys are entrepreneurs and, uh, you know, in my life I've been an entrepreneur. But when you think about it, 50% of new businesses fail in the first five years. And that's one out of every five, too. I mean, so it's kind of like, you know, why would you even become an entrepreneur? Why would you even open up a business, you know, when, when 50% of them fail? Well, you know. Why, why do these businesses fail? 42% fail because they got the wrong product or they got the wrong service. You know, you may think that you have invented the greatest thing since sliced bread, but if you're the only one that likes it, you know, it's going to kill your business. Or you may, like you guys have a great service that you offer, but you may have a service that nobody wants. You know, so you built this business and nobody has it and you go out of business. So you think we've, about We've been it. down that path too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, twenty nine percent of entrepreneurs and small businesses fail in the in the first five years because they run out of money. They don't have enough money. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're going to open up a business or you're going to open up a service, you've got to make sure that you've got enough money in the bank to last for six months. Because you got to assume you're not going to have sales for six months. Yeah, you know? and and if you don't. It's going to cause you to go out of business. But the the one that really that really impacts me and the one that, that bothers me the most is 23% of businesses fail because they have poor teamwork and communications. Now, mm. as an entrepreneur, you think you know it all. Okay? You think that you, 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 you understand every aspect of it. But I can tell you that you as an entrepreneur... Yeah, as an entrepreneur, you got to make sure you got to you got to admit right up front what are your weaknesses. Okay, what aren't you good at? I mean, you know, if I ask myself, what am I not good at? Even though my life has been on the internet for the last thirty years, it's you know, I don't know how to program. I don't know how to write code. You know, so so I've got to find somebody smarter than me to write code. You know, I, if uh, I don't like CFO kind of stuff, I, if you put me in a a room with a spreadsheet for eight hours, I go absolutely nuts. I've got to find people who like that. So, you know, one of the greatest failures of entrepreneurs is not surrounding themselves with people that are smarter than they are. You got to admit that's the first thing you've got to do is admit that I don't know that. I got to find somebody smarter than me. So Mark, tell me what what's a what's a good way for a mentor to tell somebody else that they know they're not the smartest but they're happy to do their best to help. I think honesty is the, the number one thing. Mm. I think if somebody said that to you, you would say, I, I, I can trust this guy. I can trust this girl. If they're willing to admit that they don't know and I need your help, I can get into that. I think I can have a relationship with them. So that's what you do. Just be honest. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry to keep beating on this, but I do find our listeners love practical tips. And one of the biggest mm -hmm. questions we get is how do I start mentoring? Where do I start? They want, again, they want to do it. They're excited too, but they just don't know how to start. Is your community a place to start? Are there like resources that you've had in your community or how, how have you kind of gone on that mentoring journey to be able to, to make that part of your, part of your life? Oh yeah. That, you know, that's all part of our site. If anybody has a chance and go take a look at www.babyboomer.org. And we've been able to uh, pull together over 500 experts in all kinds of fields. So the reason we built babyboomer.org is because you know, our, our generation is unique in that, again, when we were growing up, we all had landlines. So we all were just plugged <laughs> into the phones. You know, Wait, and if, A phone that dials? Yeah. Oh, was, you have to you have to ask somebody to talk to the other person like yeah. you would have to call and say may I speak with this other person using yeah. your words well, so, and, so, and you better say may and not can because I've done yeah. that 
And I've had the father of the girl I was calling go, can you? I'm sure you can. End of, <laughs> end of sentence. <laughs> Click? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Call back. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. So, you know, we had landlines. And if you're lucky, we had three television stations to watch. Um, and that was it. And so we, as a generation, grew up, you know, with all this. Our generation is as diverse as any generation before or after it, religiously or uh, politically or ideas. I mean, it's very diverse. But we have all this in common because that's how we grew up. When you, when you think, I mean, we grew up during the Vietnam War. You know, we had that to, to be in common. But we grew up, you know, during the Kennedy assassinations. We all have that in common. So we've got these experiences in common, but we also have the music. I mean, when you think about it, you know, whether it's the Temptations or the Association or the Three Dog Night, you know, or the Beatles, you know, that's our music or the movies, you know, whether it's uh, Sundance and the Kid or whether it's, uh, you know, Animal House, we all experience that. That's the thing that we have together. So we built this site to not only uh, relive those great days, but to, to talk about what we do today, you know, what are, what are the, what's a baby boomer generation doing today? I mean, we got to worry about retirement. We got to worry about uh, finances, you know, but we were interested in travel. We're interested, as you mentioned, in pickleball. There's all kinds of systems for that. Then we got to feel like we need to deep dive on pickleball when you're done. Yes, we do. Yeah. Yeah, we got to worry about what what happens in our next phase of life. We have a whole big section on Alzheimer's and dementia and Parkinson's and and all that. Mark, tell me how you've seen baby boomers find mentors for themselves. Because one thing that Augmenters is a huge promoter of is when the mentoring relationship shifts. So in the beginning, often the mentor is somebody older and hopefully wiser. And then our last principle of augmenting is the change, the transformation that comes. So, evolution. yes, the evolution. So, when that evolution occurs and the older person then starts to ask for help, for instance, it sounds like potentially at times your grandkids are mentoring you on you know tech issues. I'd be curious, how does a baby boomer maybe reach out to another baby boomer and ask, hey, you've been traveling. I'd love to just kind of bounce some questions off you. Could you chat with me? Like, well, what are some tips on really kind of building that bond quickly? Well, let's talk about another area that is affecting baby boomers more than anyone else. That's caregiving. Okay. Mm. So in caregiving, all of a sudden, uh, the baby boomers in the middle of caregiving, you know, they're, you got to worry about your old parents, if they're lucky enough to have them in their 90s and so forth, you got to worry about those. You got to worry about your kids. Some of them made it, some of them didn't. You know, what are you going to do with those that did and how are you going to handle those that don't? So we recognize that. And, I, you know, and at the time we didn't recognize this as a mentoring. We just figured this is a need we need to do. But as you're talking about it, I'm thinking about, like, wow, this is really a great mentoring area on our site. So we have a huge area of our site on caregiving. Advice of people who are doing it, advice of people who are looking to have that do it, you know, and advice that they're getting. So our mentoring is happening from younger people helping the older people. And it's ha happening from older people that are, you know, that are helping younger people that haven't gone through it yet. So, you know, mentoring is a great word that has all kinds of meanings. I love that. And I, I think because at the end of the day, a mentor is sharing with you some experience that they have been through that will help them along their journey. And to your point, caregiving is such a hugely challenging, transformative time. And there's so many elements of like emotional, physical, financial to go through. So mm -hmm. having a way that people can kind of show up for each other and say, hey, I did a lot of research and this is what I've learned and this is what I'm going to share with you. That's super valuable. That's super valuable. And I'm curious too, like, if you've seen any of your sort of audience or cohorts finding ways to mentor, like with Big Brothers Big Sisters or with local churches, or you know, how is that kind of volunteerism maybe showing up? Because I know again, that's sort of I mean, I'm just thinking specifically of an older woman in my life who is a baby boomer and I know she would love to volunteer, but she just doesn't know where to start. She lives in a big city and you know, it's just like I don't know. So is that is that a resource that you share as well? Oh, what's interesting is after this podcast, I think I'm gonna put a tagline on our site. Uh, you know, mentors, you know, let's come on in. We'll give you some mentors. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe even you're... be an aug mentor. Augment yeah. your mentoring. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So the other thing that you realize as you're getting older, 
is what is your legacy? What are you going to leave behind? You know, again, uh, how much money you make doesn't really matter because you're not going to take it with you. What What are your kids and grandkids and peers going to remember you for? And one of the things you just mentioned is, you know, how do I do that? Now that I may have some extra hours, how do I leave a legacy? How do I volunteer? You know, whether it's at the food bank or helping, uh, you know, with the caregiving, what do I can I do? It's a big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal, Mark. And and mentoring is a phenomenal way to do that because you can really scale your potential for impact. You're not just leaving a kind of groove in a chair from watching TV. If you are talking to an individual, you don't just leave the chair behind. You leave actually idioms. You leave slogans. You actually leave a little piece of you in the ear, on the shoulder of a younger person who is going to carry that piece with them. And just like a tree giving off seeds, it can continue to to blossom and continue to influence that individual and future individuals. So it's almost a legacy that keeps on going. So we found that mentoring is a powerful at scale method for leaving a legacy and really building satisfaction for the individual who's leaving that legacy. Oh, and I just want to say too, sorry, just to jump in that the idea of unsolicited advice that you mentioned from your children who are like, oh, there is somebody who wants that solicit that um, who wants that who is soliciting that as advice. You are providing unsolicited advice to people who don't want it. And there are people who want it and who need it and who are going to hear it totally differently when you are not their parent. So mm-hmm. I, I think there is, of course, we are all three entrepreneurs on the phone. So we're already coming up with a new business idea. But how do you really yep. connect those people who need that advice in that specific area with the baby boomers who have that advice? Like, is there a way to, to make that connection? Because I think that's the point, right? People are kind of talking to their kids or kids aren't listening. They get frustrated. They talk to their friends or friends are kind of tired of hearing their same story. But there's probably a huge group of people who would be incredibly advantaged to hear it. So there you Absolutely. go. Mark. And that is one reason. For you. Yeah. And think about it. 20 years ago, there was no social media. You know, now there is. So how do you get involved? Because social media can influence what you're doing too. You know, whether it's uh, baby boomers love Facebook. Not everybody does anymore, but they do. Yeah. So, so how can you create these groups that will help other groups? So, and that's one of the greatest things about this whole internet, you know, is it gives you a chance to connect. And I take a look at, and I go back to being entrepreneurial and uh, business. Today is the greatest time in our history to open up a business. There's no doubt in my mind. Mm. Um, You know, my own personal things, I've been in the retailing and wholesaling and manufacturing and all and selling, you know, products to customers and things like that. That's, that's my life. But, you know, 20 years ago, if I wanted to open up a store, I could open up a store. I'd buy a, 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 go to a a physical place. I'd, I'd do it. My customer base would be in my town or maybe the county. That's as far as it would go. But now, if you've got an idea and you want to sell something, and I'm, your, your guys are an example, if you want to let the world know who you are, you don't do the normal advertising you do in your local paper. You, you can do that. But if you want to become big, you got to use the Internet. The Internet has changed how we view. So with, with very little money, you can start an idea or a business and use the Internet and get everybody involved. So this whole social media thing is really... The, the the modern day of mentoring is how do you communicate with people? You know, how do you get them involved? And if you're an entrepreneur and you're listening to this, this is the best time in the world to open a business because you can do it for less money than you've ever had to do before. And you can reach so many more people than you ever could because of this great internet. And I am completely obsessed with the idea of senior entrepreneurship and older people starting businesses later in their lives when they can do something that they're really passionate about, they kind of are doing it for a different reason. And then going back to Jimmy's earlier point about evolution and reverse mentoring, what a great opportunity to learn. You know, I have people on my team who are in their 20s and 30s. My God, they know so much about marketing and about social media and about how, you know, e-commerce and all that. So I think that's a great chance if you do have entrepreneurs within your audience who are able to find younger mentors who can help them maximize the internet and maximize social media and find ways that they can really start businesses without having to go open a whole facility and stand there all day for 14 hours. They're tired enough time for that, but they can do that on the internet as well. So I think that's another really 
cool way to bring both what you're talking about, the internet and with mentoring together. Yeah, I love it. Mark, we always like to ask a rapid fire word association to our guests. So I'm going to ask you about four words and one theme at the end. And I'm curious what immediately comes to mind for you. Right? And you can't say baby boomer, right? <laughs> That's the qualifier. So when I say the word mentor, you say family, family. How about mentee? I say my wife. How about sponsor? I say younger generation. And coach? Coach is the most important position there is. And Care Bears. Care Bears. Oh, Care, Care Bears Care. Care Bears. I say uh, teenagers. Oh, teenagers. I love it. <laughs> I love it. And then... Tell me, and this might be an interesting question, especially for baby boomers, but let's look out 20 years, maybe when baby boomers are not as engaged as they are now. In the year 2050, what is one thing that you hope mentoring relationships are like? What do they need to be doing maybe? Or you know, how are they making people feel? Or how are they creating impact? I think that the first thing we need to do is take a look at our country today. Mm -hmm. And think about how divided it is. I mean, they can't get anything through Congress. Can you imagine that if the older senators and the older the representatives actually reached out and tried to mentor the younger ones, what would be different? So my hope is by 2050 that this country wakes up and we realize that we have got to work together to get things done. And that starts with, you know, the older generation say, reaching out and let's work together. Let me help you mentor. Let me teach you what I've learned over the last 20 or 30 years. And so that can help you make better decisions. And so that's what my hope would be. All right. Love it. Beautiful vision. Well, honestly, this has been such an interesting conversation and we really appreciate the chance to hear your perspective and congratulations on your great work with your website and with your book and bringing sort of these new ideas, support the community, the mentoring uh, to baby boomers. And we will definitely have links in the chat again to the book and to the website. And we've really enjoyed our time together. Thank you so much. Jimmy, wow. Yes. I feel like I have a lot of business ideas. I was actually really excited about this conversation because I feel like I hear a lot from older people about looking for purpose and looking for community and looking for belonging. And that really is our mission. So thinking about ways that that community and belonging can show up with the older generation. I love the idea of create the curiosity. And you create curiosity by beginning to ask questions. So if you are going into a relationship with somebody younger, begin a question by saying, where do you want to be at the end of a couple conversations with me? What is the setting that you hope to live within? You know, who, who are the people, who are the characters that you want to be interacting with more and more? And then just be quiet and listen. Well, and the idea of having a mentoring conversation like reading a book to a small child is definitely not something I feel like we've heard before. <laughs> and it took me a second uh -huh. to be like, hmm. But I think the idea of engaging somebody, uh, engaging a little person like Fiona, when you're reading a book like that is like asking questions. So it's not just like reading the book, right? It's like asking those questions. So as you're sort of teeing up for that mentoring moment is like asking those questions as you go on. And I did think, which he didn't mention, was also book recommendations because I find that when mentors say mm -hmm. like, actually, you should totally read this book and then have a conversation about it afterwards, that's a great way to start a mentoring relationship or start a mentoring conversation is by recommending whatever resource or favorite book you have. I, uh, or for people like me with uh, shorter attention spans, potentially, it could be an article online or a link to a website Ooh, or an a infographic. blog about how to use Trello as CRM. <laughs> oh my! So uh, <laughs> no free ads. My bad. But uh, it, it's true. I think sharing something that you care about begins to show, without telling, that you're going to be honest. You're going to be yourself. And if you can also add in a piece about acknowledging like, hey, I might not understand everything that's going on with you, but I'm here for you and uh, I'm excited to be as helpful as I can. That's a great preamble to 
a relationship that has the potential to really evolve over time. Yeah. Yeah. And creating space for it in the time. I think that's what I really appreciated hearing about. Also, like when you are older, you have more time to listen and to be able to connect the dots, to be able to make suggestions. And that is a huge benefit. So I am super pro, pro mentor, cheerleading and champion with this community for a lot of reasons. And I also am happy that this resource is available, certainly knowing that a lot of people with caregiving and changes to their health status and financial, that's a group that I think really needs to have access to information in a way that Gen Z has access to all the information, but making sure that they have a way that's, that's, that they're able to access it as well. The idea of leaving a legacy via mentoring is powerful. And I hope more people realize that you can start leaving that legacy today. Totally. You don't have to be at a certain age. You can start building those bonds now. And you can start having the conversations with your mentees yes. about what would be a great name for this next Okay, generation. literally, that's Maybe what was like, on my mind. And I was going to ask you, I feel like you had something in your head for that. I mean, I really wanted to just call it the boom generation. Everything's fast. Just boom. I like that. Or just boom, like boomers. not even generation. Yeah. It's just like, oh, yeah. You know what boom, boom is into? Boom's into things fast. Well, now that we've figured out all the marketing needed for a whole span of people born within a 25 year. A lot of people, you know, that's a, you know, marketing demographics is like a big business, my friend. Mm, okay. For, for the next show. Uh, yeah, no, this was, this was really fun. Augmenters out. Augmenters out. Wow, you've made it this far, and we thank you. Hopefully, you enjoyed our episode and discovered new ways to bring more authentic connection into your mentoring relationships. Want to tell them more, Jimmy? Be an Augmenter with us. Visit our website for the best interactive mentoring content at augmenters.us. Share our podcast with someone you care about. Like and subscribe. And yes, really, you following our show and writing a review, it's a big deal. Your actions provide us with the resources to continue our undefeated, unencumbered, prize-winning productions. We welcome questions and suggestions via email, hi at augmenters.us, or on social with our handle at augmentershq. We are most active and available on LinkedIn and YouTube. Shout out an earnest thank you to our intrepid producer, Erlen Cato. We appreciate you. Augmenters out. See ya. Thank you.